The small Hampshire town of Allsford is as every foreign tourist imagines an English town to be. There's been a settlement on this site since Saxon times, and reference to the liberty of Allsford is made in the Doomsday Book. The town is famous for the watercress beds that surround it, and it is from these that the Midhance Steam Railway takes its name, the Watercress Line. The Midhance ran between Allsford and Ropley, but there was a gap over what railwaymen used to know as the Alps to Alton. Fortunately, the preservationists in 1976 bought all the land from British Rail when they closed the original line. But because they couldn't afford all the track, the town of Alton had become another railway outpost. In 1980, the Midhants started to lay plans for an ambitious project to rebuild the Seven Mile Gap. It was realised that operating three miles between Allsford and Ropley wouldn't make the railway a major tourist attraction or financially self-sufficient in the long term, but motivated by the need to build a secure future for the line, a new railway would emerge from the dereliction. has been the headquarters of the Midhance since it opened in 1977. Many of its visitors come to see the picturesque town, so it made sense commercially to operate over the section to Ropley. The rest of the original line to Winchester was abandoned because of the planned M5 motorway crossing its path. Ropley, at the other end of the line, is one of those Victorian stations built in the middle of the countryside. It oozes the charm of an age past. In 1981, it won the Best Preserved Station competition. Only five years before, it had been forgotten and unwanted. The railway has built an engine shed in the yard and the topiary has been returned to its former glory. At the bottom of Ropley Yard was the end of the line. Chairman John Taylor had grand visions of the future. I see the long-term future of this railway as a major commercial undertaking providing a recreational facility already recognized by the county council a major recreational facility taking the pressure off the seaside resorts the new forest and places of that nature i see a tremendous future for this railway i see interchangeability between british rail tickets and our own people coming from waterloo and using a through ticket straight the way to Walsford to be able to come out of the hampshire countryside for a weekend or a day I the first stage of the plan was to lay the track as far as Medstead and Four Marks, halfway between Ropley and Alton. The station had been badly vandalised. All that remained of the signal box was a hole in the ground. Charles Lewis remembered the place in better days. Well, I remember this as a very friendly station to get on a train because there weren't many commuters. The train that I used to catch left here at 7.42 in the morning. And I suppose there was about 20 or so regulars, of which about five or so actually made it right through to Waterloo. And uh, it was very friendly. We knew all the staff. There were two or three regulars, mainly the ticket collectors who we used to know from time to time and just casually looked at our season tickets, which were rarities in themselves. I mean, mine was uh, Medstead and Four Marks to Green Park, sort of a journey of four trains to the office and four trains back again, and uh, specially written for the purpose.
By 1982, redundant panels of rail and concrete sleepers purchased from British Rail were arriving and being stacked in Allsford Station car park. Out on the three-mile section between Ropley and Medstead, the volunteers were preparing the way by clearing the jungle that had grown since the rail had been removed in 1976 by the scrap men. In places, it was difficult to imagine a railway ever having been there. Meanwhile, it was business as usual at Aldford. With steep gradients either side of Medstead and a locomotive taking between five and ten years to restore, a clear engine policy was required. Locomotive superintendent, John Bunch. We couldn't run small industrial tank engines. They haven't got the capacity even for the short three-mile run that we're on at the moment. The J94 is about the smallest engine we can accommodate and um, even that would be limited when we go to autumn. With the line is 1 in 80 gradient, 1 in 60 in places, um, we need the big engines to work over the line, but um, when you work it out on maintenance and repairs, um, it's probably cheaper to run a bigger engine. So, in the summer of 1982, the great project was underway. The railway had purchased two Boyer-Schwartz track-laying gantries to lay the panels. But if they don't fit, you can hardly use a hacksaw from Holford's. Something substantial is needed. The track-laying gantries run on service rails seven feet apart, either side of where the track panels are placed having been lifted off a wagon at the railhead. Three miles of service rail wouldn't have been practical, so when a section was complete, they would have runners placed under them and then be pulled forward. This proved very time-consuming, but the volunteers were learning all the time. Ah, come and drift off. <laughs> Their laying was barely underway when British Rail had run out of track panels to sell. Not that the track laying team were left twiddling their thumbs. They had the track already in position to align. As ever, it was down to muscle power in the end to slew the track with jacks. By the time the rail train started to push their loads up the bank from Allsford, it was winter again. The diesel would always push its load to prevent the risk of a breakaway wagon on the steep incline. In the cutting of Ropley Soak, there was more delay because it was very wet and the service rails were constantly bogged down in the mud. But slowly, the railhead battled its way towards Medstead. Oh, 
The railway at this time had bought 20 redundant coaches from British Rail, including several buffet cars, in anticipation of the extension opening. Inside Ropley Shed, the work continued on restoring engines and coaches, as well as maintaining the service fleet. With steam engines and compatible coaches becoming more difficult to obtain, it was a case of buying for the future. The sole source of steam engines in Britain is a scrapyard at Barry in Wales. By 1982, there were very few locomotives left that were viable restoration projects, at least in terms of time and money that would be required. Railway lines run on granite ballast. It's a kind of cushion under the rails, as well as keeping the sleepers in place. For the mid-hands, this stone had to be brought in by road 20 tonnes at a time and was piled up high in Allsford Station car park to be loaded into railway hopper trucks. Perhaps it was fortunate that it was winter and the line was closed. The dust alone would have deterred visitors. Once again, the full ballast trucks were propelled up the line. The stone was then dropped between as well as on either side of the track. The line was at last starting to look like a railway. Two of the wagons had been hired from British Rail, a sign of the cooperation the preservationists were starting to get. By March 1983, Medstead was in sight but here, a complete station layout had to be built. Track at both platforms, points for the engines to run round coaches, sidings, telecommunications. A big enough project in itself. The signal cabin had even been lifted onto a new brick base. The new carpet of ballast stopped in the undergrowth towards Alton. Despite appearances, Keith Robinson was not lending a hand. This is a placer ballast tamper. The machine was once again bought redundant from British Rail, for whom its life had expired. It lifts the rail, agitates the stone under the sleepers, and aligns the track. It sounds a simple job, but in fact, it's a highly skilled task. Just imagine doing it with jacks and shovels. At last, the great day arrived for services to start. On a spring evening in 1983, the T9 was ready, waiting to take the shareholders on a special working from Allsford to Medstead. Inside their meeting, however, many were worried. There'd been a lot of bad publicity, with board members resigning, accusations of mismanagement, and the departure of two general managers. With the benefit of hindsight, the troubles were growing pains. But what's for sure is that the colossal achievement of the volunteers in getting the rails to Medstead dominated everything. The mood on the train was one of festive relief. Ropley, in the fading light as ever, looked as if it was in another age. Society chairman Robin Higgs 
put the politics and the achievement into perspective. I think the members have responded magnificently. In fact, I'm sure they respond in relation to the job that there is to be done. This has been shown by the work they put in this last winter under all, all sorts of adverse conditions to get this, get this open. And I think this will continue. We all join the railway to get from Winchester to Walton. Well, we can't get to Winchester, but we're going to get to Walton. The volunteers are absolutely behind the project. Ken Woodruff was to lead the new management team. The volunteers have built the railway to Medstead in spite of the management. Uh, we have now got to improve the management so the volunteers can perform in an easier way. They've sweated blood and really they deserve better management. The railway now had to plan the final stage to Alton. Meanwhile, the public enjoyed a much improved ride. A period of consolidation now followed. Many jobs on the new formation needed completion. An internal telephone system was installed between all the stations. Signalling and passenger facilities improved, and of course the finance for the next stage had to be found as well as planning the task of filling the gap between Medstead and Alton. This is Boyne's Wood Bridge, and the view from here in 1964 was this. In 1984, it was this. A year later, it would be transformed. This time, the rail would be laid from Alton to Medstone. The work started in the late summer of 1984. The scene looked familiar, but fundamental changes were to be made in the way the task was to be tackled. Material could be brought in by rail to Alton. One problem was the Butts Road Bridge outside the town. It hadn't had any attention since 1948, and some of its steel beams were badly wasted. Another big job, but it was repaired shot blasted and painted as good as new. 
The Shrave cutting north of Medstead had suffered the ravages of time. Being very deep, there'd been a considerable fall of mud. And being the steepest part of the line, one in 60, when it rained, a small river formed. The preservationists showed, once again, their spirit of not doing anything by halves. They hired a digger and three dumper trucks and removed approximately 1,500 tonnes of soil. The rail trains once again pushed their way up the bank from the other side, this time using a new diesel shunter bought from British Rail. The most significant change in the operation was played. The mud and service rail problems of 18 months before were solved by an 80-tonne Orion crawler crane. Because it was hard, the track laying had to go on for seven days a week, even though the labour was voluntary. But it completed a distance in a few weeks that would have taken months with the gantries. The route had been surveyed and pegged before the line was laid, and the panels put down in the same order that they'd been taken up by British Rail. Rule one of track lane, it had not been possible on the first section. It was also a sign that British Rail were not only now taking the project seriously, but assisting as well. They had already remodelled the track at Alton Station to accommodate their new park. February 1985 brought snow, and the line passing through the highest part of Hampshire attracted some of the worst of it. Damage was caused to the rail gantry's engines, and the comparative warmth of Alton Station was needed to thaw out the frozen components before they could be reassembled. <laughs> Outside, work could still go on. The paint may have been near freezing, but stripping the old was another matter. At a time when blizzards and blocked roads were everywhere, a surprising number of people could be found working on the railway. The volunteers were not going to be stopped by a little bit of snow. During the years of building, work had continued, restoring and improving the operating part of the railway by all departments. And even in the snow, someone could be found at Medstead. At Ropley, they were all in the shed, and how pretty it looked outside. At Allsford, the railway shop in the extension built from the dismantled station at Lyme Regis was open. There were even customers. The crawler crane had finished its work just before the snows had come, and the gap was now one third of a mile in the Shrave cutting between the Hampshire Hunt Bridge and Medstead. The navvies of the 80s were nearly there.
Here come the navvies digging up the land. Driving track by the sweat of their back and the big shovels in their hands. Arms as tough as a steam driven hammer, strong as the rock they're breaking. All hours that God and the devil might send, work until the backs are aching. Sweating in the snow, slogging in the rain, where the sun is burning. Rocks and clay, bugger all the day. Think what the company's earning. Once again, the new alignment had to be ballasted. Two stone trains a week were arriving at Alton from the West Country. During the cold weather, ballast in the trucks was sometimes frozen solid. But with the snows gone, work could start again in earnest. Not only laying track and ballast, but burying cables, building a signal box at Alton, planting signal posts at Medstead, and many other tasks. Once the British rail engine had uncoupled from the hopper trucks and returned to its own tracks, the mid hand shunter propelled the wagons up the bank. They were discharged in a few hours to be collected later in the day back at Alton. The whole extension used something like 10,000 tonnes of stone to go under the 2,000 sleepers in every mile of rail. Finance for all this had come from donations, a share issue, grants from Hampshire County Council, the English Tourist Board and bank loans. By 1984, even the banks were taking the project seriously. A steam crane was used at Alton to load the track panels onto trucks. Each panel weighs about 10 tonnes and is 60 feet long. Not the most manoeuvrable of objects, but in one day, the volunteers managed to dispatch 16 loads to the railhead, and with the railway only having six flat wagons. The low Hampshire Hunt Bridge had prevented the crawler crane being used all the way. So it was back to the Boyer Schwartz gantries. The service rails had been laid the length of the gap to prevent any pulling up problems in the mud and save time. It was now April. 1985, and it was becoming a race to complete the extension in time for the operating season. The final panel was to be laid at 3 o'clock on Friday the 12th of April, connecting once again Alton and Alsford. It had been a superb effort by everyone. It had only taken six months to lay the four and a half miles of railway despite the appalling conditions of winter. The last track panel being in place was by no means the end of the story. The volunteers having prepared the track, a ballast tamper was hired from British Rail. It came with its own crew to align the track to a very high standard. The formation looked as good as a main line. The policy of surveying the route and relaying in order was paying off. 
The Tampa was available only at night, and it looked as if Star Wars had come to Hampshire. Inside the machine, it was difficult to stand. By hiring the Tampa, the railway was able to hasten the day when the line would start to earn revenue. Another example of good commercial sense, like the introduction of buffet cars on every service. The prestigious Watercrest Bell Wine and Dine train, as well as improved marketing. The new line was passed by the Railway Inspectorate and the first train passed through Medstead on its way to Alton on the 25th of May 1985, pulled by the N-Class locomotive that hauled the first train into Alsford in April 1977. As it disappeared down the bank towards Alton, everyone was conscious of what a magnificent achievement the rebuilding had been. It was a completely different railway from the one that had existed in 1980 when the project had begun. Now it could be said that the Midhance had come of age. The first train entered Alton at 11.30. It wasn't greeted by crowds and fanfares, but by the volunteers who had made it all possible. The dream had come true. A very auspicious occasion. Thank you very much and thank you for coming. I hope it be the first of many. While on the platform, dignitaries from the towns of Alton and Aldsford greeted each other, locomotive superintendent and driver of the engine, John Bunch, was elated. Well, it's fantastic, isn't it? The amount of people who said it couldn't be done, we've proved them wrong, and we've done it, and the railway will run forever for posterity, hopefully. Chief Executive Ken Woodruff was in no doubt about his feelings. Very pleased for everyone that has worked so hard to achieve this really marvellous example of engineering. It's the largest single project of a standard gauge railway in the UK. I think they deserve praise beyond measure. This railway is my monument Long after I have gone Whenever trains run wheel on Steel. You'll see what I have done Just look around and think on me Whenever railways run
With the line now open to passengers, the start of a new period for the railway had begun, one of further development. Medstead is one location that has been transformed out of all recognition from the vandalised shell of 1980. It is now a classic country station. Charles Lewis, one-time season ticket holder, was impressed. Well, the first thing that strikes me when I come back here is... Uh... The sense of surprise that everything has happened so quickly in the end that uh, a lot of people have obviously been working very hard and they've carried out not only the main tasks of making sure the signal box has been put back and in working order, but also the small tasks like the tubs of flowers and the lampposts, the sort of things which the station was actually known for, believe it or not, in uh, former days. And uh, one can really imagine how it used to be in... Uh, 1930s, 1940s, just by seeing how it is now. And it's a terrific tribute to all those who have taken part in the exercise of restoration. Restoration has taken place all over the line. Allsford Station was extended to give better shop facilities and an information office opened. The ravages of the building site of 1982 are healing. Alton is no longer a run-down British rail station. The track layout has been changed, a new signal box built, and the two companies' platforms divided. But already, it's developing an atmosphere of its own. Ropley still has its unique charm, which has not been spoiled by a footbridge and a picnic area but there's still much to do. The signalling at every station needs restoring so that train services can be intensified. Another big task. Facilities for the volunteers as well as the public need improving and the engine shed and repair areas must be extended. There's a turntable to be built, a complicated civil engineering project. And of course, there are engines to restore both steam and diesel. So, when MP David Mitchell cut the tape at the official opening, it was a day of celebration. The line was turned over to the volunteers and closed to the public. From that moment onwards, the Midhance could be called one of Britain's premier steam railways. Once again, it was possible to travel from Allsford to anywhere in Britain by rail, albeit with a change of motive power at Alton. So, once again, you can go by electric train from Waterloo to Alton and then by steam over the Alps. <laughs>